Hi everyone, thanks for joining the uh, TSC meeting. Uh, today we have Carmelo uh, here talking about uh, P4 Southbound architecture. So, okay. yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Brian, for the uh, very concise introduction. Uh, so the goal of today's meeting is to present you some uh, ideas that uh, we've been elaborating along with uh, other people at OnLab or in the P4 Brigade like Yen, Andrea, Thomas, and uh, Yi. And, uh, and this idea uh, evolved around the, uh, the need to integrate <clears throat> uh, P4 into, into ONOS. And specifically in, in, in this presentation, we're gonna focus in the, in the ONOS southbound. So the, I would say the, the long-term goal is to, is to make ONOS aware of the P4 paradigm. So we don't necessarily care about the programming language that P4 is, but the, the, the new paradigm about uh, uh, you know, this, uh, programmable data planes. So what we care about in ONOS is uh, protocol independence, so the possibility to match on new and standard protocol ladders and also to perform actions on them and the ability to uh, reconfigure at runtime the pipeline each time uh, we need to support, for example, a new protocol or a new capability. So how are we gonna do that? Our idea is to uh, uh, use an approach in which we start by focusing mostly on runtime control of P4 devices and protocol independence. So basically we assume devices are already configured with a given P4 program, or at least if required, we, we're gonna support only the first configuration at device connection. So the idea is for the moment uh, not to um, uh, think about how to provide services to actually reconfigure many times uh, the pipeline once the device is uh, serving traffic. Uh, the second um, principle is that we're gonna allow uh, only minimal amendments to northbound APIs. And the reason is that, uh, that we think the very exciting stuff about P4 and ONOS uh, are in the northbound. So, you know, what kind of northbound APIs can be exposed to applications to make use of these advanced capabilities? So the idea is that in this first phase, we're gonna focus mostly on support for no standard match actions and pull rules. And we also produce recommendation to later rethink, define, uh, uh, rethink or define new northbound APIs. Finally, we're gonna use the lesson learned uh, when developing the BMV2 POC in 2016. So regarding the, the POC, uh, the BMV2 POC, BMV2 is a, a P4 reference software switch. At the time, uh, BMV2 offered only a thrift-based API for runtime for remote control. So for example, to install stable entries once the uh, switch is uh, programmed with a, with a P4 program. But the thrift based API is not, is not a real, it's not a real SDN like control protocol. It's not like OpenFlow. So yes, it allows to install table entries, but for example, didn't offer support for packet ins or packet outs. So as a result, I had to produce an ACT version, an ACT version of that uh, BMV2 software switch in order to support those packet ins outs. Regarding the lesson learned uh, from, from that experience, the, the, the first lesson is that, uh, I think realized that at the time there was no real control protocol specifically targeted for, for P4. So we had to produce hacks. We had to define our own uh, protocol. In that case, um, I used Thrift to support packet ins, packet outs. The second lesson is that the honest Norban abstractions are already extensible enough for protocol independence, or at least to provide minimally protocol independent features. So with with ONOS, we can already express P4 program specific match and actions using the existing extension, extension framework in four rules. And the final lesson is that uh, by um, when, uh, when programming a device with an arbitrary P4 program, we can reuse existing ONOS applications. So those applications that use, for example, flow objectives, and standard criteria and treatments, if we provide ONOS with enough information to understand the given P4 program. In that case, we need to provide ONOS information on how to map, uh, for example, criterion types to uh, user-defined P4 at their names. And also we need to provide translation logic uh, in order to translate ONOS instructions to uh, user-defined P4 action. So with that in mind, uh, we look at today, 
and we see that finally, uh, you know, some work has started to define um, uh, an actual control protocol for uh, for uh, specifically targeted for P4 device. This protocol is called P4 Runtime. It was announced at the latest P4 workshop and is part of the effort of the P4.org API working group. So P4 Runtime is a program independent runtime API for P4 enabled devices. This is based on gRPC and as such, uh, it is described using uh, protobuf. It allows interacting with entities defined in a P4 program. So if I write a pipeline of 10 tables, for example, P4 Runtime allows me to install, uh, remove or modify entries in each one of these tables. Similarly, it allows me to read the value of a counter, uh, uh, configure a meter or uh, play with externs. It is independent from the actual instance of the P4 program. For this reason, it's called program independent, meaning that uh, there's no code auto generation involved. This is different from, for example, program dependent APIs that are in, in instead based on auto generation of code based on a given P4 program. And uh, also about P4 on time, is it worth? Is it worth mentioning that uh, as an actual specification, it's still work in progress by the API working group. So, so far what we have is a, is a product above definition. Uh, there's a link here if you wanna check it out. Um, and it's a, it's a product above definition with just a bunch of comments. So we, might, we have to look at the actual uh, code of the PI repository, P4 Lang PI repository to understand what's the, DBA, the device behavior. Uh, about P4 runtime, uh, P4 runtime defines four types of messages. The first one are write messages and are used to add, modify, or remove entities, for example, table entries, groups, and are defined as, uh, those, these messages are defined as blocking calls. The second type of messages are read messages that are used to read the content of the entities, for example, to retrieve all entries of a table. And these messages are defined as non-blocking calls. Then P4 Runtime uh, provides support to uh, set or get the forwarding pipeline, so to deploy a new um, P4 program to a device. And these calls are based on a P4 info.proto, which is a proto buff definition of the pipeline. So it's a, it's a, let's say, a very structured representation of a P4 program. And finally, it also offers the uh, bidirectional stream channel. So if you're familiar with gRPC, you know that gRPC is an RPC. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's based on the RPC paradigm, but it, it extends that by allowing the, uh, in this case, the server, the device to send asynchronous uh, uh, messages to the, to the client, in this case, on us. And this stream channel is used for packet ins, packet outs, and mastership notifications. <clears throat> so, Carmelo, this doesn't yeah. seem like a recipe for success, right, in some sense, that if you look at OpenFlow, for example, you can basically stream a lot of, um, you can basically stream a large number of, you know, commands, of write commands to the switch and sort of do them as a transaction, right, with a, you know, barrier and end barrier. And so it seems like this P4 interface is sort of well-suited for on-switch control, but not necessarily well-suited for off-switch control, which is kind of what we're trying to do with Onus. So, you know, what do you, what do you think about that? I mean, the big problem with blocking, right, is that, you know, it, it severely limits your processing rate, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to wait, you know, basically for the processing in RTT before you can send another uh, message. And so you can't do any pipelining. Whereas with OpenFlow, you can do pipelining. And in fact, you know, TCP kind of encourages it. So it seems that this isn't going to, that there's sort yeah. of a, a kind of disconnect between what you need for a controller like Onus and what the P4 runtime actually provides. Mm -hmm. um, I think I agree with you. Now, I don't exactly remember if the, for example, the right messages to install table entries, uh, those take yeah, only table right, entry or a bunch of table entry. But I think the, I think oh, the- there is, so there is batching, are you saying? Uh, well, I don't remember about the message yes, to install. Yes, there is. It's entry. a repeated set of updates, and then the right response is just an empty message. Okay, so- is the ACK an active ACK or not? That's sort of another thing that was a confusing issue with OpenFlow that we may care about. We may care about for us. One thing is for sure is that uh, let's say before and time doesn't offer those uh, nice features like like explicit transactions like in OpenFlow. 
uh, if this is going to be supported in before and time i don't know maybe depending on on the experience if i remember well the first version of openflow uh i mean did it have such extensive support for uh, uh for transactions so maybe maybe we'll evolve in the future yeah. carmelo yes uh, on, on the right messages when you say they're blocking calls is that just convention i mean from a proto definition perspective, you don't really specify whether it's blocking or non-blocking. That's more up to the implementation that gets built for a particular target language. Mm -hmm. uh, this is how write messages are defined in before and time. So you send okay. a write so request message. There's nothing there that would force you to use a blocking implementation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure, for sure. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. So of course, the question is, you know. If the implementation is blocking, you have to respect the semantics, right? I mean, you you, you know, if it's if it's going to explode, if you have multiple yeah. calls, yeah, you, well, yeah, if the server's going to explode with multiple concurrent calls, yeah, you're yeah. Right. So I mean, that's actually kind of an important an important thing and an important thing for Onos if you want Onos to work properly. But I can't I can't imagine that you'd write a server that wouldn't support multiple concurrent calls. But I don't know. <clears throat> I think this relates to my previous point about. Uh, the lack of an actual specification of the protocol. So what's the device behavior if I send a bunch of uh, write requests without waiting for the actual response? Or what happens if I open multiple channels to device, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 I think if you, if you go down just a little more for the write request, that gets into what Yen had said, that you can put multiple updates oh, yeah. in the same message. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but like, you know, what happens with, you know, like you said, multiple channels, outstanding ones, concurrent ones, what are the semantics? I think, I think that that's the problem about, that's the problem about these, you know, data specification languages um, in the sense that they don't, they don't tell you the semantics, right? And they also don't tell you the proper usage. So, you know, I think it'd be, well, it's, it's, you know, it's a source of, that sort of thing is a potential source of many errors when we actually plug it into ONOS. Mm -hmm. But I think it's in the scope of the uh, API working group to produce a specification. So the actual, the, the, right now they have a reference implementation of the switch agent that talks, that implements the uh, gRPC server of the P4 runtime definition. And I think if we look at that code, we can understand what's the expected behavior of the device. But right now there's no, there's no actual specification. Okay, uh, so moving forward, uh, all right. So we already, uh, I mean, we already saw a few examples of before, but just to make you understand how, for example, uh, table entries are represented in such a program independent API. So to install a table entry, basically, uh, we have to format the message like this, in which we specify the table ID, uh, where this ID is derived from the P4 program, and a list, uh, so repeated, uh, a collection of field match, and an action. The field match is specified in a very generic way in which each field match is associated with an ID. Again, the ID is derived from the P4 program and the type of match. So if it's a ternary match, uh, we should provide both the value and the mask. If it's exact match, just the value. The same for the action. Uh, actions are defined using the action ID. Again, that can be derived from, from the P4 program and the list of parameters according to the action definition in the, in the P4 program. <clears throat> so what about switch configuration? So far we talk about uh, runtime control, but how do we actually get port description, port statistics, manage LADs, or for example, uh, get telemetry data from the device? So the, the API working group suggests using existing open, open config data models. So they're not, they're not planning to define new data models, but rather to use existing ones. When it comes to open config, there's two options for uh, data transport and RPC protocols using either RESTConf or uh, RESTConf or GNMI, where GNMI is a gRPC-based uh, RPC protocol for uh, network management. And so in the effort, so inside ONOS, we're going to focus mostly on GNMI, and that's because uh, GNMI will, be, uh, will be soon uh, supported by BNB2. But if you know, another P4 device comes out and supports, uh, uh, for example, NetConf, you should already have the capabilities to um, configure that device. Yeah, so, so Carmelo, what are you thinking will be the, the hardware target? So, you know, uh, certainly, you know, so for example, we might, three that I can think of like are, 
you know, the Acton switch, you know, running with barefoot hardware, um, you know, FPGA, like the hardware that we used at, um, mm -hmm. at the P4 workshop, and also uh, Netronome. So out of those three, like, which ones support GNMI, which ones use NetConf, which ones use Thrift, and then I guess BMB2 is a software target. Uh, yeah. And then potentially other P4 targets, such as uh, Pisces uh, would mm -hmm. be another one, and, you know, others. So, so what's your thought on these, uh, like, config mm -hmm. protocols? Like, which ones are the best ones for this set of, like, hardware and software switches? Okay, so my thought is that uh, BMV2 supports both P4 and DEM and GNMI, and being the reference software switch, I guess and I hope that uh, other targets will take the example of BMV2. I can really speak from other vendors. My feeling is that uh, GNMI might be the might be a suitable a data transport, given that before end time it's also based on gRPC. Uh, so having another <clears throat> uh, protocol that is also based on gRPC seems just reasonable. But then right now, so there's no there's no official information about. Uh, protocol used by uh, other targets, like for example, the uh, Edge Core Switch or the Native PGA. Well, for the Native PGA, I guess someone has to implement that, so there's no implementation. Yeah, and uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't know what Netronome uses. I seem to remember yeah. that they, yeah. they, yeah, they, they like, I don't know what they use actually. But mm -hmm. they also, P4 and I think oh wait they, they actually generate a P4 API as well but I don't I don't know what their control protocol uses. Well I don't think they don't they don't use any control protocol. My understanding is that you know as yeah, part of the control, control control development app. process you develop also the the on switch control plane. So on in this case network interface card control plane. Yeah, yeah. So I guess there are two issues with the other P4 hardware, which is both control and config. So, mm -hmm. which may be different than BMV2. So it's something to think about, about how you'd plug in, you know, if we ever want this to run on actual hardware. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that we introduced uh, before on time and GNMI, uh, we can talk about the architecture. So how do you actually uh, program um, P4 devices using ONOS? So in these figures, the red boxes are basically what's new. And every time you see PI, it means either protocol independent or program independent, just a very functional uh, wording, PI, that, uh, that we use a lot. Um, so where do we start? So at the bottom, we have the device. It can be either a BMV2 or a Tofino base switch that talks to one us using uh, um, HTTP2 and uh, protopuff based serialization. So meaning that at the lower level of ONOS, so at the protocol layer, we will have a gRPC based transport controller. Um, this controller takes care of managing the session to the device. But then the actual uh, implementation, the P4 runtime specific implementation is uh, relegated to the driver. So the idea is to have a default layer of drivers, both for P4 runtime and GNMI. Uh, and have uh, a, a, a set of driver, so a driver for each version of P4 on time. And then as already as we already do with other uh, devices in ONOS, we can have device-specific drivers. If you want to support, uh, let's say, device-specific flavors of the specific uh, control protocol. So in this case, Tofin and BMV2 that can actually reuse the implementation of the default drivers. Uh, on the right, you can see this uh, pipe conf. So this pipe conf are basically uh, uh, elements in the form of applications or ONOS, ONOS applications that are meant to pack together uh, all the information necessary for ONOS to understand and control a P4 program. So the pipe conf contains both the pipeline model, the um, can contain the target binaries to actually program a device. So it will contain the target binaries for PMB2, for Tofino, or for another other target. It also contains all the code necessary, so the, all the mappings and code to translate um, ONOS entities to P4 program specific entities. <clears throat> so at the core, we will have a PipeConf service that will be uh, responsible for managing, managing all these PipeConfs, uh, basically associating a PipeConf to a device. And then we will have another service called the Fluoril Translation Service, which purpose is to translate Fluorils uh, from, let's say, the 
uh, from honors to um, to program to P4 program specific uh, uh, table entries. In terms of application, in terms of applications, we can disting distinguish two types of applications: so pipeline agnostic applications and pipeline aware application. So with pipeline agnostic, what we mean is uh, those applications that uh, are existing today and that use uh, mostly flow objective and intents to program the network. So for these applications, in order to, to actually control a device, we actually need to provide means to translate flow objectives uh, to the uh, program specific table entries. For uh, pipeline aware applications, I mean those applications that actually um, know how the pipeline is structured, so they make uh, the, uh, the use the most the actual pipeline that is uh, deployed to a device. And this application can continue uh, uh, controlling the device using uh, flow rules. In this case, flow rules will have two modes of operation. First one, in which we use standard criteria and treatments, so the existing, I don't know, Ethernet criterion types or IP criterion types and the existing instructions, for example, for forwarding or for uh, modifying uh, the other. At the same time, uh, we should allow flow rules to support the specification of uh, pipeline-specific criteria and treatments. So if you're interested, there's already a patch on Garrett with all the interfaces that you see in this picture, and um, please feel free to review it. Okay. So now that I, you know, I, I, I outlined the, the 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 architecture, we can move on and go more into details into each of these elements. So the core, uh, the first thing is uh, the first question is how do we enable uh, protocol independence in flow rules? As I said before, during the BMV2 experience, I uh, realized that the existing extension framework already allows to uh, express arbitrary uh, match and actions. The problem with the extension framework is that uh, the extension classes uh, the extension classes are driver dependent. So meaning that I actually need to query the driver to get the, the proper extension class. While uh, now it makes more sense to have uh, protocol independence, independence defined natively in ONO. So the idea the proposal that we make here is to define a new criterion and instruction type. Uh, for the criterion, we call it a protocol independent criterion. The idea is that this uh, criterion can describe all the uh, match fields that cannot be, cannot be expressed with existing criterion types. So the idea is that this criterion defines a list of uh, match fields defined as in P4 runtime, time, so with their ID as in the P4 program, and uh, both value or mask, if it's a ternary match, uh, expressed as a byte sequence. Uh, similarly, for instruction, we have this new instruction called protocol independent instruction that basically it's a wrapper around a, a, a P4 like table action. So, in this case, defining only the simply the, uh, the action ID and the list of parameters again as a byte sequence. So this is how we plan to enable protocol independence in flow rules. Second, I talk about uh, the pipeline configuration uh, that for uh, simplicity we call, we call just the pipe conf. So again, the, the idea of the pipe conf is to pack together data and code necessary to let ONOS understand the P4 program. The reason we, we use the .or format is because it's just a very convenient way to redistribute all these classes that are defined inside the the pipe conf to all instances of a ONOS cluster. So uh, what's inside a pipe conf? There's mainly uh, uh, three things. The first one is the pipeline model. So it's the basically a high level description of the pipeline entities, uh, meaning for example, uh, how many tables, uh, how are the tables are structured, which are the match fields, the actions, the match type, the table support counters, support timeout. And this is needed to translate uh, flow rules. The second, uh, the pipe conf contains what we call pipeline specific behaviors. So, so far, we know that driver can expose to ONOS behavior implementations, but these behaviors are device specific. Now, the idea with P4 is that some of these behaviors can change in time. For example, the pipeliner. So, to map a flow objective to a device, 
the way we map the flow objective can change in time according to the actual uh, P4 program, so to the actual pipeline that is deployed to the device. Uh, then we have uh, what we call a pipeline interpreter. This is a new kind of behavior, and it's needed to translate flow rules uh, to a protocol independent table entries. And I will come uh, to that later. Finally, the pipe comp uh, brings in also all the device and control protocol specific data. So as we, as we do in OpenFlow, we actually want to abstract the core from the, uh, let's say, the, the control protocol uh, uh, specific details. So in this case, uh, we, don't, we don't really care if the device uh, speak Open4, uh, sorry, uh, speaks uh, P4. Uh, so in this case, we, we need to find a way to uh, allow uh, developers to uh, and uh, to pack in the pipe comp, for example, the uh, P4info uh, file needed uh, by drivers to um, get the mapping between API IDs and the names of the of the P4 program entities, or also the 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 compile binaries for a different device, for example, Tofino, BMV2, and other kind of device. <clears throat> Is there any question about this part? So far? Yeah, 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 Carmelo. So, so you actually raised an interesting thing, I guess, an interesting issue, which is that, you know, how much is this, you know, protocol independent stuff dependent on P4 or, you know, versus being sort of more abstracted and not depending on P4? And you just said that, well, maybe you have a, you know, a protocol independent device that doesn't use P4, you know, and the question is how suitable would this be for it? <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't get the question. What's your What's the question? I, I get I get the introduction. Uh, is, is how um, you know is is this is this whole sort of platform independent approach generic enough that it could mm -hmm. use or pipeline independent format generic enough that it could support um, other protocol independent pipelines, for example, that use like say a future version of OpenFlow, like you know, mm -hmm. talk about Open. Yeah, so I mean, you know, enough was working on one, you know, and that kind of P4 sidestepped or, and uh, and also we've talked about OpenFlow 2.0, which would sort of be kind of more generic. Mm -hmm. Have you sort of thought about that or is this kind yeah. of tied to kind of P4 proper? Yeah, well, I think, I think it makes sense to uh, generalize protocol independence or at least to generalize the, the P4 paradigm in Onos. As I said before in the introduction, we are interested in the paradigm, not the programming yeah. language like P4. Uh, so right now, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the efforts in, in uh, if I understood well, uh, ONAP, but I'm familiar with other, let's say, efforts to have uh, uh, programmable devices, right? So P4 is not the only way you can actually program the data plane. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's sort so of my idea, other. Idea, my yes, the idea is to have a very, uh, let's say, generalized abstraction in Onos that brings in this new paradigm of a programmable data plane. But for sure, to design these abstractions, we're taking a lot of inspiration from P4, right? Yeah, so yeah. the kind so of capabilities like, would... are, yeah, 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 go ahead. I was going to say two other examples. Of, so, I don't know, I kind of touched on this in my ONF talk last year that that um, some other examples of you know programmable flexible data planes or the or pipelines that you might want to support would be things like uh, like click for example you know like the like uh, click switch or or um, or best uh, or um, EBPF would be another example and also you know things like SmartNix all of which you know it'd be ideally kind of work into this maybe uh, sort of protocol independent where you might basically you know, download a special a particular pipeline that might be, you know, it could be a Netronome pipeline, it could be an eBPF, it could be Click, and then hopefully, uh, but still hopefully have your, your program still be able to work on top of it. Mm -hmm. Well, for example, I mean, you mentioned eBPF or like you mentioned yeah, yeah. Marnie Carr. So like in this idea of having this, you know, pipe conf, yes, for sure you can provide, you know, any kind of binaries that then are, you know, pushed onto the device using drivers. But then the question is, is this programmable data plane actually uh, can be controlled using, for example, uh, or let's say, is this programmable data plane meant to be controlled at runtime as we do with uh, Inonos? So does it want someone to install flow rules? If the answer is yes, then probably these abstractions we're defining right now 
are suitable to also control uh, that device by providing support in the, let's say, uh, driver layer. Great, great. Yeah, I think in some cases it will and in some cases it won't. So that's another thing to think about is, you know, how we how we deal with these sort of multi-flavor uh, programmable devices that can potentially change their personality. And some of them might resemble, you know, match action type hardware and others might sort of be more fixed function devices that are just implementing a particular sort of data plane program with a fixed uh, sort of fixed functionality. Mm -hmm. Well, for sure, for sure, the work we're doing is targeted into this more general direction. For example, right now I mentioned the need for pipeline specific behaviors that can change in time. This is something that is not supported right now in Onos. In Onos, at the present time, behaviors are tied to specific device vendor model and cannot change in time. So to get more on the technicalities, so one of the first thing uh, we're going to do is uh, enable this uh, pipeline specific behaviors. And uh, on how we do that, I let Andrea speak. Uh, yes, the the whole idea here is that uh, since we have this uh, behaviors in all that currently are uh, one to one uh, mapping between the the behavior and the and the device, for example, uh, the pipeliner that is fixed because we know what pipeline is on the device. But right now, as uh, Carmelo said, with before runtime and before programs in, uh, in general, we will change the, these things uh, at uh, runtime, uh, depending on the program that exists on the device. So actually, uh, the behaviors will have to change. And uh, this will be uh, made through uh, basically uh, importing these behaviors uh, specifically through the pipe conf and uh, uh, merging them in the existing driver of uh, uh, the device. So we're going to use the existing uh, merge method of uh, the driver subsystem uh, and it, that requires very little change and when a new configuration so a new pipe conf comes in we unregister the old version of the program behavior and we inject the new uh, behaviors specific for the new program that is on the device. Uh, and this, uh, uh, there is only a small problem that has to be solved is that for now, uh, we have a one-to-one -one mapping between the, the device attributes and the driver. So each family of device will support the same driver. And if we merge the pipe conf with the driver, that the same family of devices will have to support the same program. But I think that with minimal change to the driver subsystem, we will enable per device and not per family of devices, uh, programmability of the driver. All right. Is there any question? How does an application, <clears throat> sorry, how does an application deal with the pipeline behavior changing at runtime? Right, so it's already pushed a whole bunch of stuff, and then the pipeline behavior changes. What does the application do? Again, uh, there's a very really bad conferencing system at OLAB, so it's pretty hard to understand the question when you get far away from uh, the microphone. How can an application react to changes in the pipeline behavior at runtime? Can you, can you make an example? Can you make an example of uh, like this reaction? So it's already pushed. Um, you know, flow objectives or flow rules or, or whatever it's, it's using to program the device, and then suddenly the pipeline behavior changes. What happens then to the existing stuff that's being pushed? Okay, so so this is something that um, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So right now we're not focusing on uh, reconfiguration of the device that can happen while the device is already, uh, uh, you know, configured with uh, flow rules. But to give you an example, uh, this is something that. Uh, we support in the BMV2 POC. And what we do, uh, the way it works for that uh, POC is that each time uh, we push a new P4 program to the device, the device is discovered again uh, from, from ONOS. So the device provider understands that something has changed in device configuration. So disconnects and reconnects the device. And you know this triggers a series of events that reach somehow the flow real manager or the you know flow objective subsystem, and so it starts the reconciliation uh, process. 
So in this case, the floor rule manager checks what, um, th which floor rules are actually installed into the device, realize there's no floor rules because for BMV2, when you change the P4 program, you actually wipe all the tables. And so the floor rule manager, in that case, you know, installs the new floor rules, but this time the translation of the floor rules is uh, done using the new uh, behaviors. Uh, sorry, so for the full objectives, it will be the, the new, um, I guess I, give you an, I gave you an answer about the flow rules, but there is, there is clearly an open question about uh, flow objectives, because in this case, we, we need to uh, recompile again uh, flow objectives into flow rules. But as I said before... Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess that's... Uh, I mean, maybe someone like Brian could talk to, like, what happens when a... What, hap like, what happens, how intense are re, re push down when, like, a switch sticks disconnect and reconnect? I guess the, the problem is that with an open flow switch, you don't need to recompile the flow objectives, right? And you just need to resubmit the, the rules. Whereas with P4 switch, the flow objective compilation would have to be redone. Is that correct? Yeah. Actually, this is a very good point. Is anyone taking notes? Because uh, I want to make sure we don't forget about this. Uh, okay. Andrea, me? How are P4, how are changes to P4 runtime, uh, P4 program runtime handled? Uh, not not an initial focus, um, but device would disconnect and reconnect with new device. The application would have to reprogram the new table. Mm -hmm. But I think in the case of flow objectives, this is a very uh, uh, you know good point because my understanding, if I'm not mistaken, or things haven't changed in the flow objective subsystem, we don't actually uh, do we actually store the flow objective and recompile them. No, we don't store them right now. Exactly. So in this case, I think we will need to store the flow objective and recompile them each time the behavior changes, so the, each time the program changes. But as I said before, it's important for us to focus at the beginning on only protocol independence and leave uh, runtime reconfiguration uh, for the next phase. For example, like you know, handling flow objectives will be a task of the next phase. Also, because some of the API might change due, due to the feedback we gave, uh, we give from yeah. the lessons we learned in this first uh, yeah. phase. Yeah. 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 So yeah. one thing is for sure for us, it's very clear how to handle runtime control once the program has been pushed down to the device. But clearly, I guess the most difficult part is you know to enable this runtime reconfiguration into Onos. So for that, we need a better understanding first of how the you know, control API works, and then we can reason about that. It, it seems even if the application is using flow rules, that it's still relatively tied to the pipeline because um, because you talked before about you have this protocol ind independent match field, um, mm -hmm. and the the values that you put in there seem like they come from the P4 program, right? So so if that program changes, then then you know, the the way the application programs the the new pipeline changes. Mm -hmm. Well, but in that case, the assumption is that that application, this programming uh, that is installing flow rules using the program specific match and actions, it's there because the P4 program, it's also on the device. So if you change the P4 program, you're also supposed to change the application. So what I, what I was meaning before with pipeline aware applications are applications that are put in place by the same people that actually provide the, uh, the P4 program or Somehow they're you know tied to a specific before program. So, so Carmelo, you seem to introduce sort of a level of indirection. So you specified um, like identifiers by their name rather than their number. So does that yeah. mean that you wouldn't necessarily need to recompile the application because it would if a field had the same name and it's just its ID had changed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good point. So before on time. Um, before and time allows to uh, control entities using uh, uh, numeric IDs, but uh, the idea is that in Onos, instead we allow uh, string-based IDs. So if you want to install flow rule that matches on, you know, your funky uh, tunnel ID, you will use the name that you provided in the P4 program. And then we have this all, you know, mechanism in the driver that looks at the P4 info file and gets the mapping between the name and the numeric ID to actually install the table entries. Uh, yeah, it, will, it will be for sure interesting also to provide ways, to, for example, to define aliases 
for names, right? Uh, so, you know, an, an, an existing application can continue working with uh, a different P4 program, a similar but different P4 programs where, you know, names have changed. Or yeah, we could use, for example, annotations in P4 programs to actually provide this, uh, you know, metadata for understanding this mapping. Were you saying something, Bob? Oh yeah, I was just saying that there's sort of an interesting issue, which is that, um, you know, which, which you're sort of touching on, which is that, um, you know, if you look at the way OpenFlow pipelines are programmed today, they're programmed with um, kind of static binding of constants, you know, whereas before you're saying, well, okay, uh, the constants now will be, will sort of let, add a layer of indirection where the constants are like intern strings, and but they're mapped to numeric identifiers. So I guess my, so I guess there's sort of an interesting thing here. Do you see, do you see a, um, do you see those two methods of static and dynamic binding as continuing, or do you see them as being unified? And do you see applications as sort of, you know, using one style or the other? And you know, can you use the dynamic binding style with OpenFlow programs, or could you use the static binding style with P4 programs? It seems like, in principle, there's nothing that would prevent you from one or the other, and it's sort of a a policy or coding choice that we would decide, you know, which which we would prefer or recommend with on us. Um, you know, I haven't really thought about this, but my feeling is that it makes sense to have to keep having, for example, uh, the R coded criterion types as we do today in Onos, and have uh, pipe count writers, so P4 program writers to provide the mapping for that, but at the same time allowing um, Allowing people to, I mean, leave, leave some freedom, like for example, in the in the um, in the naming you use for your 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 match fields. But actually, I haven't really thought about this. But this is definitely a very interesting point. All right, can we can we move on? Um, so very briefly about the PipeConf manager. The PipeConf manager is a new on score service, which goal is to, which purpose is to keep track of which configuration is in use by a given device. So said before, right now we're not targeting reconfiguration at runtime. So this PipeConf manager basically keeps a map of uh, which PipeConf is associated to a device, but it doesn't make any effort to actually enforce that the given P4 program is deployed into the device. So the assumption here is that the same configuration so once someone specify that the pipe conf is associated to a device, the assumption here that the same configuration is already deployed to the device. So there's a very uh, simple core service. So uh, going down to the protocol level, we said we're going to use. Question yes. about the service. So does that service consume configuration that's programmed into the Onos, uh, I guess, network configuration service? Or is it a new service that sends sort of parallel to it? Or new subsystems kind of parallel mm -hmm. to it? So right now we thought about, about having a new, a new subsystem, so a new manager service, because the idea is that we will extend this in the future to actually support runtime reconfiguration. But for the current purpose that I described uh, like so far, so just mapping basically the ID of the pipe conf to the device, we could use the existing, I guess, um like the existing means to actually um associate information to the device i guess we won't need to implement a new a new service but given the fact that we will expand expand this in the future i think it makes sense to have a new core uh, core service yeah i just think it, it may be confusing for uh for programmers to have to deal with a lot of different configuration service apis <clears throat> Uh, I think that the network configuration can be used to push the, the, the binding uh, to this type of uh, manager. It's just a matter of where the net config JSON lands. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, applications and external entities, we use the same, let's say, API, which is the net configuration API. Yeah, but as Andrea said, then it's a matter of, you know, which manager responds to that configuration. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, which component listens for that specific uh, configuration? 
But the idea is he has to push a JSON saying this device has this uh, uh, binding. Okay, then let's talk about the protocol. This is very uh, interesting in my opinion. Uh, so in this picture, we describe what a gRPC uh, transport controller is, but there's also a very implicit assumption, which is that we're moving, or at least this is our hope, to move from control protocol specific providers to more uh, general one, uh, more general ones. So right now we have an open flow device provider, um, BMV2 device provider, NetConf device provider. The idea is that, you know, the commonality, we, we, we could gather some com commonality from these providers and have only general device providers and have the differences related to the drivers. And I think the gRPC uh, controller allows that. Uh, I don't know, Andrew, do you want to speak about this or I can speak about this? Uh, yes, I can speak uh, about, about this, no problem. And you can add if, uh, if anything, yeah. uh, I think it's missing. So the idea is that the, you have this, uh, for example, general providers that uh, use drivers to configure a device in different, for different capabilities that he has. We can take the example of the device provider, which we will talk about later. But this is a pattern that we implemented uh, last year for some core services in Onos, for example, uh, packets, groups, uh, uh, flows. Having a, a flow provider that then relies on driver to actually apply the flows with, to which specific protocol the devices speaks. Uh, in our case, it will be uh, gRPC. So the idea is to have this uh, driver that talks to the gRPC transport controller. The transport controller would do mainly two things. Uh, one of um, one is keeping the manager channel. And that is a gRPC specific uh, channel that is constructed once because it's kind of heavy to create and destroy and it will be retrieved based on a specific device ID each time we need to generate a stub to communicate with that device. And uh, this gRPC transport controller will also be the one that is responsible for initiating this channel based on some channel builder given to him by the driver. And um, it will be the one talking to the device. It will also be responsible for instantiating um, stream of servers on specific stubs of uh, the uh, protobuf definition for the specific device. So it will receive a piece of code from the drivers that is device specific, or, or in this case, uh, protobuf specific. And uh, this uh, piece of code will have the means to attach the observer uh, to the proper stub. And uh, also, among receiving any notification from this observer that it, it attached to the stub, it will send them to the proper uh, provider, such as device events, packet in, mastership. Instead of going back through the drivers, they will feed back into the providers and into the core. Um, thanks to this piece of code that is handled, handed to the transport controller by the drivers. Did I miss anything, Carmelo? Anything no, you want no. to add? No, I think you said everything. So the idea again, just to reiterate, is that uh, so right now, for example, we have the open flow controller in Onos that notifies the open flow providers about packet events. The idea is that we have general device providers that use driver to, for example, install, so add remove event listeners. So for example, a packet listener. And then driver knows how to, uh, the drivers actually provide the gRPC transport controller, the actual implementation uh, of you know, what to do when an actual packet in is received by the device. So the driver provide the implementation then is then executed by the controller as a, as a, a parallel thread to actually notify the, the providers. So there's a loop. Is there any question about this part? No, okay, we can move on. Uh, Andrea, you can speak about that. Yes, 
So as some of you know, and uh, for example, thank you for the comments on uh, the, the review, uh, the idea was having this general device provider that basically, uh, as Carmelo said before, now we have a Netcom device provider, OpenFlow device provider, SNMP, but there are a lot of commonalities. Basically, all these providers list for some type of configuration, uh, go down uh, to the device, initiate a type of uh, transport, and then get back any detail that the device can, can give and save it into a controller for further use. So what we thought is uh, changing a little bit this ar uh, architecture and instead of uh, uh, doing a per protocol device provider, having a general de device provider that uses the device handshaker behavior, this is a new uh, behavior that we introduced, uh, we can change the name if a handshaker is too mm -hmm. close to the open flow handshaker behavior that we already have. But the, the whole idea is that uh, the configuration will be from the general provide, device provider will be handed over to the device and shaker. This device and shaker will have the knowledge of which protocols uh, the device speaks and uh, which protocol it needs to test and to uh, do uh, operations on the device. For example, I need, uh, I know that for doing master arbitration, for example, in the case of BMV2, I will go through the P4 runtime. But uh, if, or for example, to set the admin state of a port, I have instead GNMI. Um, and uh, once the device handshaker has, uh, has the code to initiate the transport with the device, it will uh, ask each specific subcontroller to do that. So in this case, it will ask the gRPC subcontroller to initiate the managed channel, but it can ask also the NetConf subcontroller to connect a device. And uh, each controller will give back a positive or negative feedback and will initiate this channel uh, using the other type of on services, such as device key store, device store, and NetCFG. And once the device handshaker is, um, is notified that all the channels, or at least one of the channels, depending on the behavior implementation, uh, can talk to the device, uh, it will report it back to the general device provider that will then will actually report it to the store, uh, to the device store. We cannot report the device from the controllers back to the store because as the current implementation of Donald Southbound is, only the providers are able to push elements to the store. That's the reason of the providers, pushing elements from the Southbound to the store. And the store accepts things only from the providers themselves, not from any other component. Uh, so what are we giving to the general device provider? This is a topic open for discussion, so I would like to hear the feedback. I have a very healthy discussion with Yuta. I actually have to reply to one of his comments now on the, the review. Uh, the idea is to give as few details about the device as possible. Right now, I'm giving the endpoint of the device, basically the IP the port, and the device key. The device key uh, is a unique identifier of uh, the, um, for example, the username and the password of the device or the SSL key that is stored through the device key subsystem. Uh, in the future, uh, the, um, we will basically uh, maybe take out even the IP import because that is somehow protocol specific as we were discussing uh, on the review. Any questions? I just want to add something which is probably a little Yes, please go ahead, Camilo. An interesting detail that will resonate to uh, OpenFlow aficionados, which is before and time doesn't support uh, 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 automatic discovery. So the device oh, yes. doesn't send hello messages to the controller. It's actually the controller that opens the, the connection to the device. And that's why we need to provide a list of IP uh, and ports to the general device provider, because uh, it's from here that we initiate the connection to the device. Yes, because, uh... sorry, go ahead, Bob. I was going to say that that's kind of a bummer. So yeah, actually, I mean, in, I think I think OpenFlow does support uh, connections either way, like inbound or outbound. But 
it's kind of one of the things that we talked about, you know, developing OpenFlow that we thought it was a much better idea for the switches to connect to the controller uh, and to enable device discovery that way. So it's kind of disappointing that P4 works the reverse. So I don't it's know, I think it's for runtime implementation. Yeah, Maybe runtime, in so. the future, something else could provide mm -hmm. automatic discovery mm -hmm. from the switch to the controller. Well, at the same time, it would be interesting to ask uh, you know, operators, people are actually using ONOS that have a you know, network of open flow devices, if they actually prefer to manually specify the, the devices to talk to, or if they let any device connect to ONOS. Because my understanding is that you know, some people actually prefer to manually specify uh, the devices that they want to control. Yeah, uh, I heard there's, the, a, there's a weird chicken and egg problem as well, which is that, you know, <laughs> for example, if you have to configure the device to set the controller, uh, you know, and you're configuring it over the network from the controller, you know, how does that actually happen? So in, in practice, I think that's kind of an issue for OpenFlow. But on the other hand, there's, I mean, I, I sort of think that there's, there are multiple, you know, there, there are use cases where people might want either one, you know, data centers and, or, and you know, enterprises where they have a configuration database that, or an inventory database that, you know, specifies all the objects in their network, you know, may want to, you know, do it that way, but other sort of, you know, perhaps more dynamic or more uh, sort of flexible environments might want the ability to, you know, just plug in additional switches, have sort of plug and play. So you could imagine either, either case might be useful. Which is, why uh, OpenFlow, which is why OpenFlow supported both of them. Mm -hmm. We were kind of main, main, more into plug and play and then into a pre-configured uh, database of everything. So, this is sort of aligned to that discussion, but compared to the flow rules and other group providers, on those cases, it was always the case that the device is, at least logically, the server side of thing where the controller side will be sending interest down to the devices. But for device provider, which side is the server is dependent different on differently on each protocol. So you probably need to be a little bit careful about designing these provider API and so on. OpenFlow in the case controller will be the server, but on the case like NetConf, controller is just a pool of connection down to the session. So how the interaction sort of works the arrows is probably gonna be pretty different depending on that setup. So you so, so far, the code I see on the gate is seems to be have strong influence from the NetConf cases, but you might want to be a little bit careful on that if you want to make this general general device provider. Uh, so the the reasoning behind this is that actually I've seen more and more uh, southbound protocols uh, interacting through the device with. Uh, Onos initiating, in the case of the device provider, initiating the connection to the device. Uh, so not looking at the open flow way of doing things, meaning the switch contacts the controller, but actually the controller goes down and contacts the switch. Uh, I, I see your point about making it very general, and maybe this is not usable for open flow or uh, device initiated connections. I kind of agree on that point. <laughs> to me, this is more controller down to device uh, operation. Did I, was I clear? Okay. So, so the scope of this work is that we the kind of device protocol we intend to support is the protocol where the device side is the server. Yeah, the device yes. is the server. Yes. Yes, the device is the server. Yeah, the, the idea is that. I was saying I, I kind of concur with you said that if if it doesn't if it's not generic enough, then maybe you should re maybe the name doesn't make sense or match it. I mean, I think that uh, uh, let me take the case. I could uh, take this uh, general device provider, and with some adjustments, make it usable for the other. For example, NetConf, REST, SNMP, and SNMP device provider. With uh, 
fairly minimum code adjustments. Bandera, but I think the question is, could you make it work also for OpenFlow? Is there a way the general device provider can also become can become like a server, for example, for receiving connections requests from switches? Is there a layer in which we can actually generalize, you know, this differentiation between client and server? Because NetConf, um, before runtime, so called gRPC-based protocols are based on the same paradigm, right? Uh, where the device is the server and the controller is the client. Yes, yes. OpenFlow is the opposite. So basically, uh, the device provider listen for events. Yes. Uh, I'll have to give a thought around this. Probably with the current architecture, it would be kind of difficult. But uh, I think there are ways to do it. One that comes into mind uh, just, just now, I need to, to probably properly shape it in the future. But uh, an idea is that we could even have a listener in the general device provider that, listen, that listens from, for events generated by a controller, such mm -hmm. as a protocol controller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because right now, what, what we do in the case of OpenFlow is that the OpenFlow controller receives uh, the OpenFlow subcontroller, sorry for the controller subcontroller nomenclature. So the OpenFlow subcontroller receives the switch notification and then goes up to the OpenFlow device provider, hands it over the device, and the, 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 the OpenFlow device provider gives it to the core. One thing that we could do is take that piece of code that receives the device inside the OpenFlow device provider and put it in the general device provider. So having a listener-based mechanism where notifications get bubbled up by the different controllers where the switch connect to. Does that answer your question? Give some maybe? No? I think we're we're losing some steam here, and we've, uh, <laughs> we've run over time. Um, yeah, yeah, we should. Yeah, we're running over time. Yeah, is there any anything uh, you wanted to wrap up or? Um, so actually, there is two other elements: the flow rule provider and the packet provider. But I can be extremely quick about that. One, one last point about the device thing: device general device provider. So we, if we assume that the device side is going to be the the target type of problem we want to shoot for is that device is a server case. I think we want to step, step back and look at how we do mastership. I think uh, uh, NetConf code, I think got an impression that there's too much of an influence of how mastership section goes in the open flow case. I think it should be defined that control is just going to be the connection pool and where the pool with the active session just becomes a candidate kind of approach could have been taken. So anyway, that was just a comment. Uh, just, uh, just a comment on the comment. I completely agree with you. The mastership has been quite some time since that I say it's very tied to OpenFlow and I need to make hacks to make it work for any other protocol. But uh, I guess it felt short on uh, everybody's uh, priority list to, to change. And also it's very tied inside the controller. So. I know it's a problem. Uh, it might be a, uh, some work to revise the mastership. All right. I think we should move on. Uh, clearly, the general device provider is uh, raising a lot of concern, and we should uh, account this. I, I actually think. Well, I mean, it, it might, you might want to go through this quickly now, but I, I think that you may it might be worth spending more time on this you know later i know we're over time but either uh i don't know maybe revisiting it or something in the next meeting or something yeah i mean maybe taking the feedback from what we've gotten so far and, and kind of pulling together a smaller subset of people to work on kind of continuing to push this forward and then representing the, the areas of improvement mm -hmm. but, but go ahead 
Yeah, just 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 to you know summarize, you know, the general device provider, we're gonna use this to control before and time, but clearly here we've been discussing ideas that you know go beyond the uh what we need for P4 to control P4 devices. So I think it makes sense also to have a separate discussion about you know this common providers, general common providers. So talking about flow rules, the architecture is very simple. How do we handle flow rules? The idea is to use the existing flow rule driver provider, then in this case use the driver to actually talk to a device. Uh, the difference here is that the P4 runtime driver, in this case the Flow Rule program implementation, will talk to a service that is maintained by ONOS, which is the Flow Rule Translation Service, to actually translate the Flow Rules. <clears throat> As I said, <clears throat> uh, Flow Rules need to be translated because, uh, just to give an example, like uh, in ONOS we have Flow Rules that match, for example, the Ethernet uh, destination address, right? But then the way we actually talk to a device to install that flow rules depend on the P4 program. If the table we're installing the flow rule on supports ternary match, then the API, in this case, expects us to provide not just the value of the Ethernet destination, but also the mask. So that's why we need a translation service. We also need a translation service to translate actions. And, I, and I'll talk about this in the next slide. So the flow rule translation service here as the pipeconf manager, the actual uh, pipeline configuration to translate the flow rule. There is a problem uh, when it comes to translation, and this is a problem shared also by other uh, providers driver, which is uh, if we basically translate flow rule, so in, in OpenFlow, the same honest flow rule is installed into the device. Here we're translating from one representation to another. The problem here is that we need to change how equality checks are down for flow rules in the flow rule manager. So equality checks are needed when querying the device for install flow rules. So to uh, uh, to execute uh, data plane reconciliation. So to install, for example, the flow rules that are missing or th those that are um, not uh, supposed to be there. So either we provide reverse translation logic which is hard and I, i'll talk about this later why it's hard or we can um so our idea is to have drivers uh give an answer about the equality of of uh, of, uh, of two flow rules so the idea is that the flow rule manager will ask a driver so the flow rule manager uh ask uh, the uh, the device uh, um, sorry sorry I'm, I'm getting lost and also a little bit tired uh, I, th I think Andrea <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so anyways the, I think I'm, we shouldn't go into details into this but the the bottom line is that uh, the way we perform equality of flow rules today in flow rule manager is wrong because that is based on the idea of equality of open flow which is two flow rules are equal if, I don't, if I remember well, the match part is equal, while you know this this is different for other uh, flow rule based uh, devices. Uh, so the idea is to have equality performed by the drivers, but I will not tell anything else about this because right now it's uh, so clear. Yeah, but point. you said it uh, very simply and basically correctly. That 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 is the problem. That right now we don't have any mean of uh, reconciling flow rules if they don't appear as we install them on the device. If mm -hmm. the device uh, kind of supports some match action type of behavior or we mimic the match action type of behavior, but we are not able to reconstruct exactly the flow rule on us expects, we get mm -hmm. into inconsistent state. So mm -hmm. we need an equality check, that's it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so talking about translation, before I talk about an interpreter that is provided as part of the PipeConf. So this interpreter is basically Java code and is needed to translate flow rules. So the question is, why do we need code to translate the flow rules? And why not a JSON is enough? A JSON with the mapping, for example, of the criterion to P4 other names. Well, for the match part, it's enough to when it's enough to have a one-to-one -one mapping between criterion types and P4 other names. But when it comes to action, there's a fundamental problem, which is that P4 allows only one action per table entry, while ANOS allows uh, flow rules to be defined with many instructions. 
So for example, if you want to solve a rule that does both either rewrite and forwards a packet to an output port, this will correspond to an action with two parameters in P4, while this corresponds to two actions in ONOS. So auto map many actions into one, that's why we need interpretation logic, so Java code. This is the, the, the same approach we use with BMV2. Uh, last comment about the interpreter is that this is an optional uh, part of the PyConf. So a program writer, so a P4 program writer that wants to use that P4 program, wants to control the program with Honest, doesn't necessarily have to provide an interpreter. It has to provide an interpreter if he wants to keep using existing Honest applications that speak standard criterion and instructions. So for those, we need translation. That's why we need to provide an interpreter. Any question about this? Sure, like what happens when the interpreter uh, you know, fails and can't come up with a, a compatible out action that implements the, the instruction list that is requested? Well, the flow rule is uninstalled. Basically, uh, this is notified to the flow rule manager using the driver API. So some error sort of propagates up to the application that you can't do that, or that it wasn't installed, and you get some you can figure out why, or an exception, or what. Well, in this in this case, I guess the applications are not notified the error, but you see that in the log. So if you're running the you know R proxy and you wonder why uh, you know your host do not probably receive ARP replies, and if you check the log, you should you should see messages that tell you that uh, that flow rules cannot be translated. Or at least this is what I was doing with BMB2. It seems, it seems that applications would probably like to know. I mean, I'm sure this happens anyway, that you can get errors when you try to install a flow rule in OpenFlow, like, oh, your table's full, or there was some protocol error, or things like that. Does that actually, I mean, presumably the applications care about that, or is that completely hidden from them, and they'll never find out about it? Maybe maybe other people in the room can answer to this question. Are errors about flow rules propagated to applications? Uh, yeah, I mean, in the flow rule batch, uh, you can provide a callback, and if there's a failure, it'll tell you which one of the rules are, are failing rules. Um, I don't think we provide a reason, but we could provide like a rule to exception map or something, which would potentially give you more information. Um, but yeah, we could we could leverage that <clears throat> mechanism for applications that do care. They could register a callback and see the rules that were unable to be installed for whatever reason. Okay. Well, let's move on. Let's talk about packets. Is the last let's say part of the architecture. Uh, just a quick note about packet ins, packet outs, and P four in general. So P four doesn't you know, support as a language for packet in, packet out semantics. This is something that is part of what is called the architecture in before. So some architecture allows to receive packets from the CPU and the send packet to uh, the CPU. Anyways, P4 runtime provides semantic uh, for that. So we can ex expect most of the P4 target implementing P4 runtime to support uh, packet in, packet out. Uh, so regarding packet in, this is pretty much like OpenFlow. Uh, so in this case, the switch sends a notification to the controller with the payload of the packet, so with the whole byte string of the packet, and also an indication of the either the physical or the logical port where the packet uh, was received. When it comes to packet outs, this is different from OpenFlow, and then it's slightly different the way we handle packet outs in ONOS, uh, because packet outs in uh, P4 runtime <clears throat> are defined using the, um, the byte string defining the payload of the packet and uh, the only the uh, egress physical port where the packet should be forwarded. Or uh, the ingress pipeline specification, which is basically the ingress port we want to emulate from where the packet was received. But this is an emulation we actually, because actually the packet was received from the CPU. So what's the point here is that in Onus we actually allows uh, we actually allow for actions in uh, in uh, packet outs. If a P4 program writer 
wants to keep using an application that uses actions in packet tiles, then we need to provide means to translate that actions into uh, the packet out. For example, if the P4 program implements semantics to execute, let's say, some sort of modification on the packet out based on the content itself of the packet payload, then it should be up to the interpreter to actually change the bits in the payload to have that action executed in the uh, in the switch. In any case, we can always uh, translate by default the output instruction. This will translate in the uh, egress physical part of the switch. My understanding of packet tiles into Onus is that most of the times we use them, uh, um, we just specify the output part where the packet should be forwarded. Uh, I think not many applications actually rewrite the the other part of the other using actions. In this case, in using P4 on time, that should be performed by the controller, not by the switch. Is there any question about this part? All right, now, uh, a quick note about the packet provider. So in this case, we will start implementing a P4 on time specific packet provider, very simple implementation as it is today in OpenFlow and BMV2. And we'd later explore the design of a general packet provider similarly to the, to the device provider. In this case, we need to find ways to register packet listener with protocol specific uh, controllers, uh, drivers loading. Um, regarding packets, so today uh, packet parsing in ONOS, it's uh, fixed. So we can parse the usual uh, address like Ethernet, VLAN, IP, MPLS, and the others. It would be nice for applications that actually uh, are aware of the P4 program running into a device, it would be nice for them to offer means to actually parse and deparse a packet using a P4 program. So an application, for example, wants to access a specific field of a packet, which is part of a very you know, exotic header. Uh, it would be nice to have means, so to have a service in Nanos that offers a generic parsing based on the, on the program model. And uh, I guess we will seek for uh, community help for this. I think this is a very nice, interesting uh, master thesis project, if there's any master students out there. So, Car so Carmelo, like, presumably there's, uh, there are, uh, actually, it's sort of a good, a interesting question. So with something like, uh, presumably there are Java libraries that, or you know, parsing sort of, you know, well-known packet formats like Ethernet and IP and you know, Internet Protocol Suite packets. But I guess the question is, are there any uh, sort of generic generic ones that exist, or is is this an, a need that you've sort of identified that that there is no actual sort of you know open source, uh, you know, decent quality generic sort of protocol independent packet parser or deparser or packet construction. <laughs> Uh, or not even packet construction, but perhaps uh, you know buffer construction. I mean, this seems very similar to like what kind of protobufs already do. Mm -hmm. it, it, are there existing libraries that can be leveraged to do this? Yeah, definitely, definitely. An example is protobuf. I know of other libraries uh, uh, develop. I'm not sure if they're compatible with Java, but with Python for sure. So my feeling is that. There exist there. There are libraries that can do that, but it would be nice to have application uh, use honest abstractions to perform this action. So if you you know configuring the device using a pipe conf and a pipe conf define a pipeline model that brings in also a parser model, you know, it would be nice to have that programmable parser into Ono. Sorry, the generic parser into Ono to use the same parser model. Then implementation wise, maybe we just need to bind, you know, our API to the external library. <clears throat> yeah, it, it really seems like a, uh, you know, a P4 um, parser specification should be, you know, something you can, yeah, it, it really seems like it's sort of a generic piece of code, right? That, you know, that, that has to be like serializing and deserializing that shouldn't be particularly difficult. And the other interesting thing is that it's, it's really similar to protobufs and other systems of that type. 
you know, serialization and deserialization. I guess data specification languages like, you know, even Yang for that matter. So it, it seems that there's some, you know, they all sort of do the same thing. And so we should be able to, you know, maybe leverage some existing systems. And, and you know, I agree that like when you pull the, when you pull the, the pipe desk in, it'd be really nice if you got the nice API for the packet parsing and deparsing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess that's all. Just to conclude, so we talked mostly about um, uh, things that are known in OpenFlow, like flow rules, uh, packet ins, packet outs. Uh, but before it defines many entities on top of tables, like uh, <clears throat> counters, uh, meters, action profiles, action profile groups. So we already have in us abstractions to, for example, deal with meters and groups, even if those are very uh, OpenFlow oriented. I'm not sure we have uh, abstractions to deal with um, generic counters that are not tied to uh, to uh, flow rules. In any case, how to control? How do we control all these entities that uh, uh, P4 defines? The idea is that initially to use driver behaviors, and then based on the experience, we will start supporting them from uh, core services. The last thing is master habitation. So before and time is support for multiple device controller channels, uh, which is somehow similar to um, what happens in OpenFlow. It's not very well defined the device behavior in case in case of controller instance failure. And um, probably we should follow up with the API working group to better understand that part. Um, I guess that's all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Andrea and uh, and Carmelo for for uh, putting together the slides and, and all the information. Yeah, thank thanks you. everybody for listening. Yeah, and providing feedbacks. Absolutely, that was great. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll see everyone next week. Okay. okay. Thank you. Bye.